I don't want to dance with Plutarch Heavensby. I don't want to feel his hands, one resting against mine, one on my hip. I am not used to being touched, except by PETA or my family, and I rank game makers somewhere below maggot in the terms of creatures I want in contact with my skin. But he seems to sense this and holds me almost at arm's length as we turn on the floor. We chit-chat about the party, the entertainment, about the food, and then he makes a joke about avoiding punch since training. I don't get it. And then I realize he's the man who tripped backward into the punch bowl when I shot an arrow at the game makers during the training session. Well, not really. I was shooting an apple out of, the roast, out of their roast pig's mouth, but I made them jump. Oh, you're the one who... I laugh, remembering him splashing back into the punch bowl. Yes, and you'll be pleased to know I've never recovered. I want to point out that 22 dead tributes will never recover from the games he helped create either. But I only say, good. So you're the head game maker this year. That must be a big honor. Between you and me, there weren't many takers for the job, he says, so so much responsibility as to how the games turn out. Yeah, the last guy's dead, I think. He must know about Seneca Crane, but he doesn't look the least bit concerned. Are you planning the quarter quell games already? I say. Oh, yes. Well, they've been in the works for years, of course. Arenas aren't built in a day. But the, the shall we say, the flavor of the games is being determined now. Believe it or not, believe it or not I've got a strategy meeting tonight, he says. Plutarch steps back and pulls out a gold watch on a chain from a vest pocket. He flips open the lid, sees the time, and frowns. I'll have to be going. He turns the watch so I can see the face. It starts at midnight. That seems late for, I say, but then something distracts me. Plutarch has run his thumb across the crystal face of the watch, and just for a moment, an image appears, glowing, as if by candlelight. It's another marking jay, exactly like the pin on my dress, only this one disappears. He snaps the watch closed. That's very pretty, I say. Oh, it's more than pretty. It's one of a kind, he says. If anyone asks me, say I've gone home to bed. The meetings are supposed to be kept secret, but I thought it'd be safe to tell you. Yes, your secret's safe with me, I say. As we shake hands, he gives a small bow. A common gesture here in the capital. Well, I'll see you next summer at the games, Katniss. Best wishes on your engagement, and good luck with your mother. I'll need it, I say. Plutarch disappears, and I wander through the crowd, looking for Peta, as strangers congratulate me on my engagement, on my victory at the games, on my choice of lipstick. I respond, but really I'm thinking about Plutarch showing me his, one of, his pretty one-of-a-kind watch to me. There was something strange about it, almost clandestine. But why? Maybe he thinks someone else will steal his idea of putting a disappearing mockingjay on a watch face? Yeah, he probably paid a fortune for it, and now he can't show it to anyone because he's afraid someone will make a cheap knockoff version. Only in the capital. I find Peter admiring a table of elaborately decorated cakes. Bakers have come in from the kitchen, especially to talk frosting with him, and you can see them tripping over one another to answer his questions. At his request, they assemble an assortment of little cakes for him to take back to District 12 where he can examine their work in quiet. Effie said we have to be on the train at one. I wonder what time it is, he says, glancing around. Almost midnight, I reply. I put a chocolate flower from a cake in my fingers and nibble on it, so beyond worrying about manners. Time to say thank you and farewell, trills Effie at my elbow. It's one of those moments when I just love her compulsive punctuality. We collect Cinna and Portia, and she escorts us around to say goodbye to the important people and then herds us to the door. Shouldn't we thank President Snow? 
asked Peter. It's his house. Oh, he's not a big one for parties. Too busy, says Effie. I've already arranged for the necessary notes and gifts to be sent to him tomorrow. There you are. Effie gives a little wave to two capital attendants who have an inebriated Hamish propped up between them. We travel through the streets of the capital with a car, in a car with darkened windows. Behind us, another car brings the prep teams. The throngs of people celebrating are so thick that it's slow going. But Effie has this all down to a science, and at exactly one o'clock, we are back on the train, and it's pulling out of the station. Hamish is deposited in his room. Cinna orders tea, and we all take seats around the table while Effie rattles her schedule papers and reminds us we're still on tour. There's the Harvest Festival in District 12 to think about, so I suggest we drink our tea and head straight to bed. No one argues. When I open my eyes, it's early afternoon. My head rests on Peter's arm. I don't remember him coming in last night. I turn, being careful not to disturb him, but he's already awake. No nightmares, he says. What? I ask. You didn't have any nightmares last night, he said. He's right. For the first time in ages, I slept through the night. I had a dream, though. I say, thinking back. I was following a mockingjay through the woods for a long time. It was Rue, really. I mean, when it sang, it had her voice. Where did she take you? He asked, brushing my hair off my forehead. I don't know. We never arrived. But I felt happy. Well, you slept like you were happy, he says. Peter, how come I never know when you're having a nightmare? I say. I don't know. I don't think I cry out or thrash around or anything. I just come to, paralyzed with terror, he says. You should wake me, I say, thinking about how I can interrupt his sleep two or three times on a bad night and how long it can take to calm me down. It's not necessary. My nightmares are usually about losing you, he says. I'm okay once I realize you're here. Ugh. Peter makes comments like this in such an off-handed way, it's like being hit in the gut. He's only answering my questions honestly, but he's, he's not pressing me to reply in kind or to make any declaration of love. But I still feel awful, as if I've been using him in some terrible way. Have I? I don't know. I only know that for the first time, I feel immoral about him being here in my bed. Which is ironic, since we're officially engaged now. Be worse once we're home and I'm sleeping alone again, he says. That's right, we're almost home. The agenda for District 12 includes a dinner at Mayor Undersea's house tonight and a victory rally in the square during Harvest Festival tomorrow. We always celebrate the Harvest Festival on the final day of the victory tour, but it usually means a meal at home or, or with a few friends if you can afford it. This year it will be a public affair, since the capital will be throwing it, everyone in the whole district will have full bellies. Most of our prepping will take place at the mayor's house. Since we're back to being covered in furs for outdoor appearances, we're only at the train station briefly to smile and wave as we pile into our car. We don't even get to see our families until the dinner tonight. I'm glad it will be at the mayor's house instead of at the justice building where the memorial for my father was held where they took me after the reaping with those wrenching goodbyes to my family. The justice building is too full of sadness. But I like Mayor Undersea's house, especially now that his daughter Madge and I are friends. We always were, in a way. It became official when she came to say goodbye to me before I left for the games, and she gave me the Mockingjay pin for luck. After I got home, we started spending time together, it turns out Madge has plenty of hours to fill, too. It was a little awkward at first because we didn't know what to do. Other girls our age, I've heard them talking about boys or other girls or clothes, and Madge and I aren't gossipy, and clothes bore me to tears. But after a few false starts, I realized that she was dying to go into the woods. So I've taken her a couple of times and showed her how to shoot. She's trying to teach me to play the piano, but mostly I like to listen to her play. Sometimes we eat at each other's houses. Madge likes mine better. 
Her parents seem nice, but I don't think she sees a lot of them. Her father has District 12 to run, and her mother gets fierce headaches that force her to stay in bed for days. Maybe you should take her to the Capitol, I said during one of them. We weren't playing the piano that day because even two floors away the sound caused her mother pain. They can fix her up, I bet. Yes, but you don't go to the Capitol unless they invite you, said Madge unhappily. Even the mayor's privileges are limited. When we reach the mayor's house, I only have time to give Madge a quick hug before Effie hustles me off to the third floor to get ready. After I'm prepped and dressed in a full-length silver gown, I've still got an hour to kill before dinner, so I slip off to find her. Madge's, Madge's bedroom is on the second floor, along with several guest rooms and her father's study. I stick my head in the study to say hello to the mayor, but it's empty. The television's droning on, and I stop to watch shots of Peta and me at the Capitol party last night. Dancing, eating, kissing. This will be playing in every household in Penam right now. The audience must be sick to death of the star-crossed lovers from District 12. I know I am. I'm leaving the room when a beeping noise catches my attention. I turn back to see the screen of the television go black. Then the words, Update on District 8, start flashing. Instinctively, I know this is not for my eyes, but something intended only for the mayor. I should go, quickly. Instead, I find myself stepping closer to the television. An announcer that I've never seen before appears. It's a woman with graying hair and a hoarse, authoritative voice. She warns that conditions are worsening and a level three alert has been called. Additional forces are being sent to District 8 and all textile production has ceased. They cut away from the woman to the main square at District 8. I recognize it because I was there only last week. There are still banners with my face waving from the rooftops. But below them, there's a mob scene. The square is packed with screaming people, their faces hidden with rags and homemade masks, throwing bricks. Buildings burn. Peacekeepers shoot into the crowd, killing at random. I've never seen anything like it. It can only, I can only be witnessing one thing. This is what President Snow calls an uprising.